Good afternoon. Happy Friday the 13th. Um, so uh, I'm Isha Dua. I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. I've been at AWS almost short of five years. Um, I, uh, I help customers be successful on the AWS cloud. And uh, there are, there's something called technical field communities at AWS. I'm a member of the AIML field as well as the environmental sustainability field. Uh, with me, I have Parth. Do you want to do a quick intro? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Parth Patel. I'm a solution architect as well. Um, I am also part of the AIML uh, community, uh, working as a specialist on uh, generative AI for uh, certain uh, customers, and uh, also part of the environmental sustainability. Um, thank you for that part. So uh, we have very little time, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, for the talk today, we're going to be talking about optimizing generative AI workloads on AWS. Uh, when I talk about optimization, I'm not just talking about performance efficiency or operational efficiency. I'm also talking about optimizing for scale. I'm talking about optimizing for sustainability as well as cost. And when I say sustainability, I mean that you're optimizing on resource efficiency. So let's look at the history of large language models. Uh, large language models or foundational models are not new. They've been around for quite a while. There's been a very active, robust research community that has been working on it for quite some time. In, the, in 2017, we had the transformer architecture come out, and uh, there were models that were built on it that, were, uh, that did very well on sequences and translations. In 2019, we had GPT-2 come out. We had Megatron LM come out. Then in 2021, we saw a bunch of different models from AI21 labs. And um, right here in 2023, we have a sea of models that's out there now. So I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Uh, but just to give you a sense of change in scale, uh, back in 2019, the largest model was around 330 million parameters. And at this point, we have crossed 170 trillion parameters, uh, which is a 500,000 times increase in size in just a matter of few years. And this is continuously increasing. It's growing at a staggering pace. Uh, I'm expect we are expecting this, this curve to only get steeper. So, you know, that's awesome. Generative AI is super exciting. But we also need to remember that uh, as these models are getting bigger, their computational costs are increasing, their environmental costs are increasing. So we need to make sure that we are uh, thinking about optimizing for resource efficiency, energy efficiency, sustainability, along with other criteria like performance and operation and scalability. So, let, so what we're going to do in the talk today is we're going to talk about the generative AI life cycle and we're going to go through each phase and we're going to talk about certain optimizations that you can do at each phase. Um, so the first phase is going to be problem framing. Uh, problem framing is when you're converting a business problem at hand and you're making that a gen, you're converting that to a gen AI problem. Um, when I say that, I mean you're asking yourself the question that is it a Gen AI problem or can it be solved using traditional machine learning approaches? Um, so, you know, what happens is that uh, once you have framed the problem, the next phase is where you're going to go into model selection and the model usage, uh, or which is model training or adaptation. Uh, here, you're either choosing a pre-existing model or you're building a model from scratch. When you're choosing a pre-existing model, uh, there might be a need for customization of the model. You might have to fine tune it, you know, just to fit it to your use case. So that's going to be the second phase of the life cycle. Um, then you're going to go into model deployment and inference. Once you've selected a candidate model and you know that that candidate model is a good fit for your use case, you have to find the right infrastructure to deploy it. Um, you have to make sure that the infrastructure is scalable, it is energy efficient, um, you have to integrate into your existing pipelines and workflows. Uh, so you have to do all of that in the inference and the deployment state. And finally, once the model is in production or is, it's in one of your lower environments, uh, you have to continuously monitor it. And why I say you have to continuously monitor is, or basically ongoing maintenance. Why you have to do that is because you want to make sure that the model is producing the right, right outputs. It's producing relevant information. And when I say relevant information, I mean information that's true as of today. So it could produce stale data as well. So you want to continuously check whether the data is relevant or not, and uh, whether there is any need for further customization or augmentation. So that's what a life cycle looks like for generative AI. 
and uh, we are going to focus on each of these phases and I'm going to talk through uh, each phase and how you optimize across each phase of the life cycle. So let's start with the problem framing. Over here, I, the first question, like I said, you're going to ask yourself is, is this a generative AI problem or is this just a traditional machine learning problem that can be solved using the existing algorithms that are out there? Let's assume you want to do anomaly detection on very high volume time series data, sensor readings are flowing in, high velocity data. Now, LLMs and foundational models can help you. They can help you spot unusual patterns in anomalies but their statistical approach lacks a bit of sustain, uh, lacks explainability. So what you want to do here is you want to use something that's a little more custom for this kind of a use case, like an Amazon time stream or something that's, of, that's like a time series database that's built, that's purpose built for a scenario like this. So always go back and, and try to understand whether what you're trying to do, whether this needs a foundational model, does this need a language model or does it not? Does it align with your business goals or not? Um, are you, is this any sustainability innovation that you can do here or not? So the first thing is make sure the problem is a Gen AI problem. Second would be choose the right region to deploy to. If you're looking at AWS, the, the one thing that you can do is you use a region to deploy to that has lower carbon intensity. And when I say that, I mean use one of the 22 regions that are attributable to 100% renewable energy. Um, that way, whatever sustainability optimizations AWS is doing on their data centers, on their infrastructure, you're going to inherit them just by deploying your infrastructure in that particular region as well. So that's a definite optimization that you can look at. The third thing would be um, when you have to pick a service that you're going to use to build your generative AI workload, deploy or train your generative AI workload, pick a managed service. Um, like an Amazon Bedrock or an Amazon SageMaker, even a queue. Because what, what it's going to do here, like it says, it shifts the responsibility of maintaining high utilization, maintaining sustainability optimization of the deployed infrastructure to us. You don't have to spend all of that extra time, you know, making sure that your hardware and the infrastructure that you're using is uh, up to date, it has all the latest patches and software patches, has the latest hardware updates. So you were taking away all of that undifferentiated heavy lifting from you. So what you want to do is you want to try to use as many managed services as you can because our service teams, our managed service teams are continuously working on making sure that they are built on infrastructure that it does not have idle or wasted resources. So use of managed service is another key step that you can take in the problem framing stage. Now, uh, we are at the model training phase. We, we know that we have a problem at hand, which is a Gen AI problem. Now we have to go into the model training or the model usage state. The first thing you're gonna do in this state is you're going to uh, select a model. So where do, okay, so that now somebody could ask me like, oh, there's like 100,000 models out there now, like which one am I going to select? So just remember that what, have usually, what we have usually seen with customers is that people pick a model um, and then they, they, you know, they try to fit it into the use case for which they have to fine tune it a lot, they have to customize it a lot, which uses up a lot of computational resources. It uses up time, it uses up money. Um, so. The, the one thing you can do is you can make sure that you're selecting the right model from the get-go. And how you're going to do that is by asking yourself a certain set of questions. Like, for example, you know, uh, do I need a general model? Do I need a domain-specific model? When I say domain-specific, I mean, am I, in the, am, am I in the healthcare industry trying to build a workload that's very healthcare-specific? In that case, I would want a domain-specific model. But if I don't need a very domain-specific model, I can go with a generalist model like a GPT or a, something that is like purpose-built for a vast variety of tasks. So do I need a domain or do I need a general-specific? Do I need it to be fine-tunable? What should the quality of the model be? How much should the latency of the model, like what latency is acceptable to my users? Should it be open source? Should it be proprietary? Do I, do I have Japanese customers? So do the, does the model need to understand Japanese? Does it need to be multilingual? You've got to ask all of these questions ahead of time in order to make sure that you're selecting the right model so that the need for customization later down the line is relatively low. And therefore, you are not spending all of those computational resources and all of that energy downstream. So um, that would be the second step, that select the right model. Um, make sure you go through the model leaderboards. Now, 
you know, with the advent of Gen AI, you'll see that a lot of leaderboards have popped up and then they are uh, benchmarking and comparing all the different models that are out there. So read about the, read the leaderboards, read the model cards very carefully before you select a model. So that's gonna be the very key step here. Build a decision tree, build a mental map to select a model. So that you have to do less of this. If you select the right model, you do less customization. Now this is a very important infographic and it actually, uh, I really personally find it very useful, not in terms of, not just because it's showing you that it's increasing car, uh, energy consumption and carbon emissions, but also it shows you um, increasing level, levels of effort. Um, so prompt, this is a, the, what this is showing you is that there are multiple customization techniques, but what you wanna do is you wanna begin from prompt engineering if that doesn't work, try a RAG. If that doesn't work, try PEFT. And then if nothing works, that's when you want to train a model from scratch. If training, a, training from scratch is a very uh, time intensive, costly, very difficult process to go through, uses a, a lot of compute. Uh, so you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Every, I am assuming most of you know what prompt engineering is. Define your prompts carefully, craft them, make sure it's very explicit for the model. If there are, in the model cards, if there are examples that this is the kind of prompt that works best for this model, try to use that instead of spending, you know, too much time experimenting. If you found a perfect prompt that works for a certain model, save it as a template. Put it in your version control systems. Put it somewhere so that if there are other teams that want to use the same model, they're able to repurpose your prompt. And they're not do going through these extensive compute cycles all over again and spending all of that money all over again. So prompt engineering is a technique. If prompt engineering does not work out, let's say it's not giving you the results that you will, it's not giving you the accuracy that you wanted, that's when you're gonna to go to RAG, which is retrieval augmented generation, wherein you're uh, supplying the model with external sources of information. When I say external sources of information, I mean information that might be, let's say, private to your organization. Uh, you've added that, and now model, the model has this additional context which is why it's able to generate more tailored responses to your uh, questions. But let's assume a scenario where prompt engineering didn't work, RAG did not give you the kind of results you were looking for. That's when we go to the third step, which is parameter efficient fine tuning. Um, this is a whole topic in itself, but just to give you like a short summary is um, PEFT, it finds all of the, so this is giant model but it finds all of the underutilized aspects of that model and it injects certain trainable weights into the model and only tunes those weights. It doesn't tune all the weights of the model. So you're only spending, it's just spending little computational power versus a lot of computational power. So PEFT is a way of doing that. It has many techniques, it has LoRa, a lot of you might have heard of LoRa, low rank adaptation, P-tuning, prefix tuning, and Part's gonna to touch upon it later as well. Um, let's say, but there are scenarios when none of these have worked, so we go to full fine tuning and we go to the training from scratch steps, wherein you have to make sure that you are using the right kind of infrastructure, you're using the right kind of energy efficient hardware. Uh, so this is something just, you know, I, I would say that if you were to take away something, just remember that this is the way that you would think about customization in terms of increasing effort, in terms of inc increasing carbon emissions as well. Uh, can we take it towards the end? Sure. Yeah. Um, so now what I wanted to do is I want to touch upon each of those customization techniques really quickly. Uh, keep your prompts concise and short. Um, you know, you can see that this is not a great example. I know that you want to know about generative AI, but you've written that in convoluted manner in like a hundred different sentences. You don't want to do this because the more number of tokens you're going to have, the more processing the model is going to have to do, the more money it's going to cost you. So make sure your prompts are concise, they're short, uh, they are to the point and direct. And other than that, there are other prompt engineering techniques that I would definitely recommend for you to like sort of read up on. There's chain of thought, chain of thought prompting. So what you do is you ask the model to provide its reasoning step by step and how did it come to this conclusion. There's zero shot where you don't give the, any examples to the model in your prompt. There's few short prompting where you give some examples 
uh, in the prompt to the model. There's React, and like we said, we mentioned prompt templates. Make sure you create a prompt template anytime uh, there is a successful prompt for a model and store it somewhere and keep them concise. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Parth at this point to continue from here. So, sure. Thanks, Isha. So, um, we see about pro uh, uh, prompt engineering. Um, another popular method is retrieval augmented generation. What it does is it gives additional context of your organization to the model so it can give an answer from your content because model doesn't have your organization or your personal content. So if you want to give additional uh, information, you can use REC. Now, this is a most popular technique and most of the industry uh, use cases have some or other type of REC. Um, and we can, we can uh, dive deep uh, in, in, a, in a separate session as well if you, if you need. But um, other, if the REG also has some limitation. So for an example, uh, what REG does is it takes some part of the document, let's say you have 100 documents. It picks up few part of the document which is related to the question that you ask and take all those information, supply it to LLM and say that which uh, particular answer could be from those part of the document. But let's say you have a huge repository of document and a lot of the document has a similar content, then REG will not be able to find out the right document out of it. So in that kind of scenario, you may want to move to the, uh, the next step, which is um, uh, for that, you want to move to the uh, performance efficient fine tuning. As Isha mentioned, right now, uh, GPT-3 has a 175 billion parameter, for an example. Now, if you want to fine tune all of them, you need a huge resources in terms of compute, energy, cost. What this technique does is instead of doing the fine tuning, it will just have a subset of the parameter that required to have a fine tuning. For an example, if you want to do the translation, you don't need to change everything in terms of what is an understanding of the language. You just need to add additional context of the new language. So you change the parameter only certain part of the model, uh, and then uh, you can give uh, get your answer. So this will improve your accuracy much higher for uh, your use case. But again, PEFT cannot solve all the problem. That's where you need to go to the full fine tuning of the model, where you can uh, fine tune entire model, all the parameters for your industry. Uh, it, it would be a domain specific, uh, for an example, a medical domain or for manufacturing industry where it can fine tune all the model and give the very specific response based on your organization, whether it's a guardrail, whether it's a, some certain processes that you want to follow. Um, and if even fine tune will not be able to solve the problem, then the last option is to train your own model. Right now, uh, most uh, this is a uh, not um, it, this is not been adopted widely. But you can see that when new application or web application comes into the play, there are not everybody was adopting it. But now all organizations have their own com portal, own uh, you know separate uh, use of applications. After five years, there could be scenario where each organization will have their own model, and for that, it uh, you can utilize uh, uh, some of the. Uh, AWS um, uh, instances, specifically Trainium, which is purpose built for training purpose, uh, training the model, which will help you leverage most of the uh, GPU performance that is available. Uh, it will also uh, help you reduce the cost as well as it's more sustainable uh, in terms of training the model. Now, um, once you have the trained the model, uh, let's move to the third phase of the life cycle for a model deployment. Now. This is a big problem because this is a large model and it cannot fit on one instance. And there are so many queries coming into this model, it is not able to serve all the responses. So for that, there are so many different libraries that are available, specifically from the hugging face, um, a depressor, faster transformer. What uh, SageMaker and uh, uh, Amazon has does is it's provide a deep, uh, uh, con uh, this, uh, deep learning containers which has inbuilt these libraries, what it helps is it is able to execute different layer of the network on a different GPU, or uh, it can have a sample of a, a comprised, a compressed version of the model so that it can give you whatever query comes in, it redirects to a certain part of the model. So this way, it will, very, it will be very efficient to host the model. 
Now, again, if you are using out of the box model, out of the box services, um, it might not need it. But whenever you reach to the stage where you fine tune your own model, that's where it is, it is being more useful. And uh, for that, AWS has a AWS Inferentia, which is uh, specifically designed for inference, and it is 50% more um, efficient for, uh, uh, for uh, compar comparatively other instances. Um, and the last part of the life cycle is observability. Now, when you see that if you want to improve, you need to have a benchmark for your own model, for your own response that you are getting from the model. Now, if you have, do not have a benchmark, you are not able to optimize it. So there are different ways that uh, AWS can help using CloudWatch or uh, other tools where what is the response time? What is the first token response time that you get from the model? Um, what are the drift? So previously, it was answering certain way. Now, because the data has been increased, now it is answering on a different way. So how you monitor each and uh, every changes. So start logging in prompts, start logging in uh, the telemetry data, and uh, you can uh, able to identify and improve the performance overall. So this is a high level of the summary of the um, life cycle of the generative AI. Right now, most of the use case will be, um, as Isha mentioned, uh, the key slide. And I, I can go to that slide, where uh, if you want to take away a specific thing is the five phases of the uh, 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 five phases where how you can identify where you want to move in the stack. I know you had a question. Uh, my question is, is there a user interface that prompts those uh, questions. It's a guide for the users like who are trying to do model training and customization and has a database. Oh, these are some, this is what you put, but this is what some other people put maybe as a suggestion. Any Anything like that in AWS or elsewhere? Does, did, did that make sense? <laughs> Um, so, from what I understood, you're asking if there are uh, specific guidelines or like uh, something, like a tool or something that can teach you how to effectively craft prompts or effectively train a, basically if go through each of these steps and how to do it, like best practices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Not that, I, not that I know of. Uh, now, uh, again, I think uh, you want to remember that these steps are not going to apply to all of your generative AI workloads. This is a general guidance of when you want to customize a model, you're going to go through a series of steps. And these are possible steps that you can do to customize a model. But this is the order in which you should do them. You shouldn't jump directly to full fine tuning or training from scratch. If, if let's say you used a model XYZ, and it didn't produce the kind of result you wanted. You're like, yeah, this is not working out for my use case. In that case, customization might be needed, but there are many ways to customize. So my, what we are trying to tell you here is that start from prompt engineering. Don't jump to any of these steps that are mentioned on the bottom because they are more computationally intensive. They're costly for you. You need a lot of budget for that. You need money, time, everything. So these are guidances mostly. And for each model, like I mentioned, like when you go to the, the, the provider's site which has launched the model, you'll see a model card. That model card sometimes also has examples, like this is the kind of prompt that worked best, or these are the kind of best practices you should follow. So that's where you know what the mo model provider itself is recommending for how you should craft prompts, how you should fine tune. Sometimes that guidance comes directly from the providers. And when I say provider, I mean like, an anthropic or an open AI or a stability AI. These are providers that are building these models. Does that make sense? But no, there's no one, one, not one in all. Like two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is no single tool, but what, uh, as, as we go for the observability and monitoring part of it, 
uh, what is recommended is whenever you try any of the application start logging all the prompts that you have ever used okay slowly you can identify that this particular prompt gives me more and then it changes so now i need to go back to a different one so um, there is no tool to the short answer but you need to develop based on your organization strategy that how uh, that will fit uh, in your stack yes Uh, it's uh, again based on your use cases right there is no um, each model that you fine tune they provide a specific guidance in terms of you need x number of uh, iterations that you need to perform for a set, uh, x number of uh, data so it is based on different model for small model it might be less for a huge model you may need to a lot of data to make sure that model understand what you are uh, you know giving it as input so it depends upon that but uh, you eventually uh, when you fine tune the model, you are reducing the context. But you need to figure out the right trade off that how much context, content that you reduce will eventually help. Are you going to repeat it, uh, repeating that use case or not? If it is one time content provider, REC could be uh, a proper solution because eventually it's a trade off. There is an, an entire generative AI is a probability. There is no 100% answer or guarantee because it's, eventually it's a Small. No, no, it will not generate its own example. It will just try to understand that this is a source of truth and is identifying that this is what it is, right? So whatever I should answer, this is a source of truth and it tries to map that. So it will not generate a synthetic data. The ideal approach is if you have a very small amount of data, you can uh, generate a lot of synthetic data and then give it as an input for the model. So that is one way to add more uh, examples. 